Oh, did you want me to go over? I'm going to search for it, but I don't really want to edit it. Let me look at it. What was the question? Uh, well, I'm just asking if anybody wants me to go over any homework questions, and uh, Nicole says number four, possibly, but she's not sure. <laughs> she was like standing by. <laughs> Let's see. I think I was like, what was it followed? It was okay, that council is going to be creating that campaign. But what I ended up with didn't end up with what the future is doing for pump. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me just talk through it. Um, let's see, which one is this? This is incompressible and ideal gas. So I think this is uh, control volumes two. Yes. Control volumes two. Control volumes two. Number four. Okay, so, um, Drawing water through a pipe yeah. from a reservoir. It's calculated in the village, so um, not like it's estimated. Mm. Okay. Uh, volumetric flow rate is given. It's water. Um, so the volumetric flow rate is always, um, you can always calculate the mass flow rate as the volumetric flow rate. times the density. density yeah. yeah, or um, that's the same thing as Inverse volume. volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. Um, stupid pounds. Um, Let's, uh, that's all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions about that one or any other homework questions? Um, I guess just a confirmation that that velocity doesn't do anything. Is that relevant to the final answer? Um, yeah, we might as well put that in. Okay, let's go through this. Uh, I mean, anything they give you, you might as well put in if... Uh, um, when you're, so basically what this is, is in these control volume problems, you're canceling all this stuff. Um, a lot of times you make reasonable assumptions about what to cancel, but if they give you a number, just put it in there, you know. We're still going to assume that um, the volume is negligible at the exit. That the volume? I, I, sorry, the speed, the speed is negligible oh. at the exit. But this is saying it's pretty fast at the inlet, so we'll put okay. that in there. Okay, so you're, you're, so is that a, always something you assume with a pump? Is that if the speed is zero? Usually the zero? speed, the difference in the speed is negligible, so but... You're saying the difference is negligible. Right. Yeah, okay. um, at the inlet, the pressure... Okay, let me think about this for a second. Uh, pipe inlet, we got a pressure, blah, 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 and a speed. Um, it's steady state. Um, if we knew that the inlet and ex exit had the same cross-sectional area, mm -hmm. then, well, we know that they have the same mass flow rate um, because it's steady state. Uh, I think it would make the most sense to assume that assume that the inlet and exit have the same cross-sectional area and so that speed is going to be the same and so they're going to cancel either way so it's not going to come into it 
Um, but if you, you can imagine if the inlet is really narrow and it's really screaming through there, and then the exit is really big and it's just dripping out of there, you could have a significant difference in speed. Sure. Um, so... So yeah, so then yes, then that term kind of falls away. I, I think the way I'm going to think about it is I'm going to assume that the area um, at the inlet is the same as, as the area at the exit, and so those speeds aren't going to matter. Um, but you could also assume the speed is zero at the exit. Okay, well, let's, let's go through. Um, so do we have everything? God, we got stuff in inches, stuff in feet. Let's just convert. I think, I mean, I have what my conversions are. Okay. Uh, 20 gallons per minute is 6.31 times 10 to the minus 5 cubic meters per second. Okay, 20 gallons per, I didn't listen to any of that. Is equal to what? 6.31 e minus 5 cubic meters per second. Okay. And the, the pressure is 101,353 pascal. Okay. Yeah, that's just uh, standard atmospheric pressure. Bless you. So I'll just call that 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And uh, 64 Fahrenheit, what's that in Celsius? Uh, well, it's 290.4 Kelvin. Okay. So that'd be like, what, 17? 17 degrees Celsius. And then 12.2 is 40 feet. Yeah, if that works for both of those numbers. Oh, yeah. 12.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with this. Uh, and it's steady state, so this is zero. And it's equal to Q dot minus W dot plus M dot times H inlet plus VI squared over 2 plus GZ inlet minus M dot times the quantity H exit plus V exit squared over 2 plus GZ exit. Um, and ignoring heat transfer, we want the power. So we want this W dot. Uh, we're ignoring heat transfer. Um, I'm going to cancel these, but uh, you could reasonably make other assumptions about that. Um, And so we have um, because it's a pump, can't you read the same pressure as the same? So I guess it's the same. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Um So now we just have M dot times the quantity GZ inlet minus GZ exit. Um, and for the volumetric flow rate, okay, so um, M dot 
is equal to 12.2 uh, cubic meters per second uh, times a thousand. It's 6.31 times 10 to the minus 5, right? What is? The, are you, the volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate, 20 gallons per... Oh, yeah, I did the wrong one. 6.31 times 10 to the minus 5. And then times the density of water. So that's just 6.31 times 10 to the minus 2. Kilograms per second. Um, and the exit height is 12.2 meters above the inlet height. So we have W dot for the control volume is equal to 6.31 times 10 to the minus 2 times 9.81. And then... Uh, this is, you can think of this as like 0 minus 12.2, so negative And I got six point three. That's like a hundred. Yeah, I got about negative seven point five five. Uh, this is joules per second, so watts. Um, does the sign make sense? Because electric power. Is yeah, on. this is electric power coming into the system, and so that should be right. Exactly. Okay. So. Any other homework questions anybody wants to see? Okay, so now we're going back to the outline. We're just going through all the topics we've covered so far. Um, so back to the outline of topics so far. Um, And the things that we've covered up until here are um, everything up through the differential first law and the heat transfer equations. Excuse me, Don. Do you yeah. like that um, warming issue? Oh, yeah, that's going great. Uh, <laughs> I'm making good progress on that every day. Okay. I'll get that to you. I'll get that to you this week, and then you'll have it to get ready for the test. Okay. Okay. Only one test late. Okay. Uh, so now we're going on to um, like the third big overall topic, uh, and that is material property relationships. Um, and uh, one thing to remember about these is uh, like the laws of thermodynamics are always, um, are always, they always deal with processes. You're going from one state to another state. These material property relationships are equations of state. So these are not for processes. These are for uh, connecting different properties in the same state.
So these are relationships. between properties in a single state. Um, and so the first thing I talked about here was the PVT surface. And remember the PVT surface looks qualitatively the same for any two substances basically except water that that has a qualitative difference because everything except water when it freezes the volume gets smaller at a given pressure water when it freezes it expands okay which is really lucky for a lot of life on earth but uh so keep that in mind if you're you can always if you're looking at the shape of a PVD, PVT surface, you can always tell whether it's water or whether it's a different substance by whether the volume gets bigger or smaller when the thing freezes at a given pressure. Um, so uh, the PVT surface, we're really just gonna use projections of this onto different planes. Um, and the important thing to remember about this is the vapor dome. Uh, based on where something falls compared to the vapor dome, you can tell what state it's in, uh, what phase it's in. Um, so this is the vapor dome. Up here is the critical point. That's when you have a high pressure and a high temperature. Um, for pressure and temperature higher than that, uh, the phase is called a supercritical fluid. Um, so over here, you have a saturated vapor. Uh, no, sorry, saturated liquid. Over here, you have a saturated vapor. Um, and so for phases, uh, you have a liquid over on this side. Uh, You'll see that referred to as a compressed liquid. Um, then you have a liquid vapor mix inside the vapor dome. And then uh, to the right of the saturated vapor line, you have just vapor. It's called a superheated vapor. Then, yeah, right. It doesn't really mean anything so much, but um, that's just what you'll see it referred to as. Um, and remember that this basic shape shows up on almost every projection of the PVT surface that we use. So no matter what you're looking at, I mean, we'll see um, entropy versus... Uh, what are we going to see? Entropy versus uh, what's useful? Entropy versus I don't know. Um, but the point is, even though it's entropy and not stuff that we're used to, you're going to see a clear vapor dome in there, and that's going to let you know at each point in this cycle what phase you're in. Okay. Um,
Uh, second, quality. So quality is only relevant at saturation. So if a problem ever mentions quality, you know that this thing is at the saturation, temperature, or pressure. Um, and it's defined as the mass of the material that's vapor divided by the sum of the mass that's vapor plus the mass that's liquid. So it's basically just the mass that's in its vapor phase divided by the total mass. Um, and x is between 0 and 1, inclusive of the endpoints. Um, if you're at 0, then that's a saturated liquid. And if you're at 1, that's a saturated vapor. Um, once you know the quality, you can use um, the saturation tables to find properties for the mix that you have. Um, so, say Q is just some arbitrary property. Um, Q is equal to the quality times the property for the saturated vapor plus 1 minus the quality times the property for the saturated liquid. By the way, you can also use this formula to calculate the quality if you're given, like for example, you know, this, the way this comes up pretty naturally a lot of times is, say you have a fixed tank and you know the volume in the tank, okay? And you have a saturated mixture, okay? Well, you know the volume in the tank is the volume of this mixture because the gas part is gonna expand to fill any volume, okay? So the volume in the tank is going to be your total Q. Okay, then you can look up the properties for the saturated vapor and the saturated liquid, plug it in here and calculate your, your quality. Okay, so um, if you're ever having trouble finding the quality, uh, that's, a, that's a likely place to find it is from the volume. Um, then uh, we have a couple of definitions. The first one is enthalpy. And remember to make the distinction between um, the extensive enthalpy, the true enthalpy, and the specific enthalpy that is more like what you want to work with if you're working with tables. Um, so the true enthalpy, capital H, is the extensive internal energy plus the pressure times the extensive volume. And then the specific enthalpy, which is very useful to us, is the extensive enthalpy divided by the mass and that's also equal to the specific internal energy plus P times the specific volume. Um, almost all of the calculations that we do seem to revolve around uh, specific values of things, I guess largely because of the tables, I guess also because of the specific heats, the way, 
the way they're defined um, and because of the ideal gas law. Um, to, to go into the first law of thermodynamics, though, you always have to go to these extensive properties. Okay, so that's one place where you're going to have to go from the specific to the, to the extensive property. Um, another place that you're going to have to use the extensive forms is when you're using that integral for the, um, for the expansion of a gas, the, the work of expansion. Okay, that has to be an extensive volume that you're dealing with. And, uh, yeah, those are the, really the two places where you have to go back and forth between the, the true form and the specific form. And then uh, at the same time that I defined enthalpy, I defined uh, the specific heats. And we had these two funny forms. Um, is it worth memorizing these? Maybe not. But um, C sub V is equal to the partial derivative of U with respect to temperature, holding volume constant. And C sub P is the partial of the specific enthalpy with respect to temperature holding pressure constant. And if you do memorize those, it makes it easier to mentally remember the simplifications and stuff because the derivations are pretty simple going from this full form of these specific heats into the simplified form. For, um, for incompressible materials and also for ideal gases. I guess that would be the benefit of memorizing these, but that's maybe a pretty small benefit since you can just look this, the, all these equations up. Um, and so now that we've defined enthalpy and specific heats, then we got into simplified material models. Those are the two, that's incompressible materials and ideal gases. Um, and these really, uh, it would be in your interest to try to remember these lists of things. Um, and we're going to add to these once we start talking about entropy. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to give you the ones that I've given you so far. Uh, so the first one of these is incompressible materials. For us, that's liquids. Um, and uh, the definitions, uh, like what's the definition of an incompressible material? You can think of it as the density is constant, which also means the specific volume is constant. Okay, um, so I'm going to write this as specific volume is constant. And this can be a little tricky to people understanding this distinction, but yes, we treat it like it's constant throughout the problem, okay? But usually to get the best results, you want to look at a saturation table to see what it is for roughly your range of temperatures, okay? And then you'll just use that value for the whole problem, you know? Um, so. You can use 0.001 for this, and you won't be off too many percent ever, you know. But for the best accuracy,
uh, look up a value in the saturation table. Um, for, you know, roughly your temperature range. <coughs> um, and then uh, the second uh, assumption you can make because a material is incompressible because you're dealing with a liquid is that the specific internal energy is only a function of temperature. Um, and then because of these, uh, we're going to say that CV and CP, we're just going to call them both C and these ugly definitions of the specific heats uh, simplified as something nice, just the total derivative of the specific internal energy with respect to temperature. And this um, is really nice because this is the one that lets us say that uh, the change in specific internal energy is C times the change in temperature. And uh, that's, that's a pretty useful thing with liquids. We'll have some problems where we'll use this formula for solids too, by the way. Um, most of the time in this class, we don't care about solids, but uh, problems where like you throw a, uh, a hot, you know, chunk of metal or something into a, ice bath, you can use this formula to figure out what the final temperature of the system is. By, well, like, like by somehow measuring the change in internal energy? Uh, yeah, so if um, you use the first law of thermodynamics and like if you say that it's insulated and no energy can escape, um, then the then the total change in internal energy of your whole system is going to be zero. Mm -hmm. And so you can use that to calculate the changes in temperature. Uh, and then the second one is for ideal gases. And the simplifications we can always use here are that uh, pressure times specific volume is equal to RT. Remember that this R is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of the material. So that's something you definitely are doing this calculation differently than you did in chemistry. Then just like for incompressible materials, uh, the specific internal energy is just a function of temperature. And if you remember this, and if you happen to remember these definitions, then it's easy to go from this to figuring out that C sub V is the total derivative of the specific internal energy with respect to temperature. Again, you can use this um, to calculate the change in specific internal energy is equal to CV delta T. Uh, for gases, though, don't use this for giant ranges in temperature. Uh, you know, think of this as for smallish uh, delta T. The reason for that isn't isn't any problem with this equation. 
that equation works perfectly well over big temperature ranges for ideal gases. Um, the problem is that for liquids, C stays almost exactly constant for the full range of temperatures uh, between, um, you know, for the full range of temperatures while this material is a liquid. Uh, for gases, CV, if you look at a curve of CV over temperature, it has kind of a big range, you know, so you have to be a little careful with it. Uh, and then also, um, it's pretty easy if you remember the ugly definition of the of C sub P, that C sub P is just equal to CV uh, plus R. Any questions about those? So now R is that constant? Yeah, that's right. And uh, it comes from, so, like, for example, I'm not going to write this down, but when I say, like, you can make sense out of a lot of this stuff if you remember these relationships. Um, so uh, CV for an ideal gas, well, uh, you can see that that specific internal energy for an ideal gas doesn't depend on the volume at all, doesn't depend on the specific volume. So we can just immediately change that to a total derivative. Um, H is equal to U plus PV. From the ideal gas law, PV is equal to RT. So you can just make this H um, U plus RT, okay? U only depends on temperature, so it's a total derivative then take the derivative and uh, you get this. Uh, the last one I wanted to mention here, we didn't really ever talk about this in its own sort of topic, but um, remember we see polytropic processes a lot. Um, and they have a form that you can write like this pressure times volume to the exponent r, I'll call it, um, is equal to a constant. And why do we care about that? Um, what we get here is, so I'm going to just call this c. Um, so we can express pressure as a function of volume then, pressure is equal to C V to the negative R. And then you can use this in the um, work of expansion integral. Um, so this is equal to the integral from V1 to V2 of C V to the negative r dv. You just have to use what you're given to calculate c and r. So um, I don't think there's a single polytropic process that you're given in this class where you don't end up then calculating that work of expansion. So if you see it, that should just pop right into your head like, okay, I'm getting ready to calculate this work of expansion. And then the last one uh, that fits into this category is the tables. Um, so the most important thing to remember about using tables is at saturation, you only need temperature or pressure to look up properties. Um, 
away from saturation. You need both temperature and pressure. Well, actually, they, it doesn't exactly have to be temperature and pressure. You can sort of reverse look up stuff. Say you've seen a problem or two where you're given a temperature and you end up being able to calculate like a specific enthalpy or something. And then you can go and search for the thing, the pressure that has that temperature and specific enthalpy. But it sure is a lot more straightforward when it's temperature and pressure that you're given. Um, and so uh, I guess as a sub section here, uh, we talked about interpolation. I mostly don't make you do that much uh, in, in problems. I just wanted to, um, to have you go through this process of interpolation because it's what a lot of numerical methods are based on, thinking about things this way. And uh, you can write interpolation this way, f of x is approximated by um, f at x1 plus f at x2 minus f at x1 divided by x2 minus x1 and all that multiplied by x minus x1. Uh, so f is the property you want and x is the property you know. Um, if you're not at saturation, uh, you have to do this interpolation in three steps. Okay, and then uh, the next big topic, uh, section four. Was control volumes. Um, and there are two equations that we used here. Um, we used mass balance and the first law. Uh, first, I'll talk about mass balance, or sometimes I call it conservation of mass. Um, and this says that dmdt for the control volume is equal to the mass flow rate coming in at the inlet minus the mass flow rate leaving at the exit. Uh, and there are two important things to remember about this. Yes, two. Uh, the first one is that the mass flow rate is equal to the area of the aperture times the speed divided by the specific volume. And the second important one is for steady state. 
So what happens in steady state is you don't get any change in properties. Um, and so that says that dm dt is equal to zero. And so uh, we can rewrite this as mi is equal to, or mi dot is equal to me dot, is, and we'll just call it, you know, the mass flow rate, m dot. So it's really the mass balance equation that gives us this thing that we end up substituting all the time into the first law for steady state problems. Is there, is there any distinction between um, velocity or capital V and volume? Capital v or, or uh, no, that's why I wrote it here. Uh, there's no like special subscript or anything. It's just all context. I, that's a super pain because they both come up all the time, you know. But um, so mass balance, and then the second. One is the first law for control volumes. And I feel like I write this equation a lot, but I might as well write it here. So D E D T for the control volume is equal to Q dot for the control volume minus W dot for the control volume. Plus MI dot times the quantity HI plus VI squared over two plus GZI minus M E dot times the quantity H E plus V E squared over two plus G Z E. And then um, I talked about some specific devices. I mean, mostly the way we do these problems is we start at this full equation and then cancel stuff one by one. Uh, but we did sort of get the general uh, ideas that nozzles and diffusers um, sort of roughly speaking exchange um, enthalpy for fluid speed. So you get a change in enthalpy that, that causes a change in fluid speed. So one goes up and the other one goes down. Um, then second is turbines. Uh, those roughly exchange uh, enthalpy um, for power. Uh, done on the surroundings. This could be electric power or mechanical power. And third, uh, pumps and compressors Uh, pumps are for liquids, compressors are for gases, um, and so both of these can exchange
um, work on the system for enthalpy. Pumps can also be used to exchange work on the system for height. Anybody have any questions about that? So that's sort of up to date where we are right now. Um, and so on Wednesday, uh, we will start talking about the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. And uh, I think everyone's going to find it pretty interesting. I think it's a pretty interesting topic. Um, just trying to wrap your head around what it's trying to tell you, you know. Um, all right, that's all.